when I got back from Jamaica, um, you know, I wasn't really sure what had happened to me. Um, and it took a while for me to really catch on. And I started questioning a lot of this stuff, and it ended up taking this form. I started thinking, gee whiz, I really like this young man, but, you know, and I was like, oh, no, I can't, you know, Terry, no way. You know, um, but I had recently um, lost my mother right. and my best girlfriend. And I did, then I, just, I started reassessing it all, and I just said, you know, why not? What is wrong with this? You know, this young man makes me feel really good. I just, I, I, I feel like I've come back to life, to be honest with you. And what's wrong with this? Why shouldn't I? Why should I feel guilty um, about doing this? And then I started thinking, too, men have been doing this for years. Really. Still are, always will be. Marrying girls young enough to be their daughters. Some of them have children older than their wives, you know what I mean? So I was like, I'm not breaking any rules. I'm not hurting anybody. And so, so I had to give myself permission. How's it working? Pretty good so far. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving into a year. So I'm, you know, it's, it's working out fine as far as I know. For most of us millennials and Generation Xers, we know who Terry McMillan is. Whether we know her from her novels or movies, she's considered one of the most popular Black authors of her generation. Publishing her first novel, Mama, in 1987, she only received a small publishing release. Due to her persistence, she was able to get her novels into Black-owned bookstores, and her popularity slowly started to grow when she was able to sell 5,000 copies. In 1989, she released Disappearing Acts, and in 1992, she published Waiting to Exhale, which helped her achieve national attention. Waiting to Exhale was on the New York Times bestsellers list for months, and it sold over 3 million copies. Macmillan's success helped redefine black novels because she was one of the first authors to focus on successful, professional, single black women in their 30s. In 1996, Stella Got a Groove Back was published and quickly became successful too. Despite the novel's success and the happy ending, the true story behind the novel was the exact opposite. Did you feel, obviously, betrayed? Yes. Yeah. It is betrayal. Yeah. And deception. Yeah. Yes. Do you feel like you missed signs that were there? Um. No, because I'd never been betrayed this way before. Mm -hmm. I'd never been with a man that I knew was cheating, period. And Do you think, he, was, he, was he cheating? Because he told you yes. that he was cheating. You think he's going to tell the truth? I, I don't know. They lie about that. But you said that he said at the time that he had never acted on it. But you didn't believe that, obviously. OK. I, I said, okay. that's like saying you're an alcoholic and you haven't had a drink. Uh huh. For those of you who have never seen or heard of Stella Got a Groove Back, let's start from the beginning. The story focuses on a 40-year-old divorcee named Stella Payne. Growing up in the hoods of Chicago, she grew up poor but worked her way up to upper middle class. After getting her MBA degree, she became a security analyst making $250,000 plus a year. That's a lot of money, especially for it being based in the 90s. She has the beautiful mansion, the newest BMW, and can afford endless shopping sprees, but something still feels missing. After her divorce, Stella decided to put all of her focus on her son Quincy and her career, but doing so made her feel like she lost her sense of self or aka her groove. While Quincy is spending time with his dad, Stella decides to take a trip. In the novel, Stella goes to Jamaica alone, but in the film, she goes with her college friend Delilah. Early into her trip, Stella meets a 20-year-old Jamaican cook named Winston, and they have a short vacation fling. Winston is instantly attracted to her and wants to continue seeing her, but Stella, of course, has her reservations. When she returns home, she's soon laid off from her job and quickly realizes that she actually feels relieved because now she's free. Because of this freedom, Stella goes back to Jamaica, this time bringing Quincy and her niece Chantel. Even though Stella still questions why such a young man is so interested in her, she leads with her heart. Winston finally makes it to the West Coast. He wins her over and dismisses her worries when he bonds with Quincy and supports her dreams of making furniture. 
In the film, it seems like they lived happily ever after, but for those of us who know the true story, that is not the case. Terry's story is pretty identical to the novel. She of course had a very successful career as a writer and she also is a single mom raising her only child, Solomon. Terry decides to take a vacation to Jamaica and of course she meets her Winston, aka Jonathan. What I love about the movie is that it's almost identical to Terry's story. During their initial meeting, Terry asked, would you like to sleep with me? And of course he said yes. This moment between Terry and Jonathan was basically the exact scene and Stella got a groove back. So what are you saying? That you would like to be intimate with me? Are you paying attention? Three months after returning back to California, she asked Jonathan to move into her million dollar home. And then they were married by 1998. Six years into their marriage, Jonathan confessed that he was gay, which clearly blindsided Terry. When describing their relationship, she says, he never gave any indication he was gay. I couldn't drive in a car without him holding my hands. He brushed my hair, massaged me, all kinds of wonderful things. During the Oprah interview, when asked if he knew he was gay, he claimed that he realized he was two years before he came out to his wife. Terry explained that this was not the truth at all. I've got evidence to prove all kinds of things that he knew he was gay when he met me. That this is basically extortion. He's a habitual liar and a sociopath. In another interview, she says, He's the one who is gay. He's the one who withheld this knowledge and information from me. He's the one who tried to hurt and sabotage my entire life. And all of this is basically because he wants my money. He's not getting it. Even though Jonathan signed a prenup, he sued her for spousal support and attorney fees. Somehow he won, which is crazy to me, and when appearing on the Oprah show, her pain was clear as day. When asked why she wanted to appear on the show, Terry said, When I came on the show, it was more to bring more attention to the kind of harm that living a double life can cause, because it caused me a great deal of harm. She admitted that she was so angry and in so much pain for years due to the portrayal. She felt like her life was a circus. After appearing on the show, Terry sued Jonathan for $40 million for emotional distress and ruining her reputation. She did win the judgment for distress, but withdrew the suit because the case went to trial. She admitted that she didn't sue him for money, she just wanted to clear up a misconception on a claim that Jonathan made. He had told lies about me that were in legal documents that were now on the internet forever. I was never trying to sue him for his money. He didn't have any. Jonathan basically claimed that Terry was homophobic, which I don't believe is the case. She was going through a lot of pain and for him to say this is putting even more salt in the womb. She also said she withdrew the lawsuit because she was tired of being angry. Anger and bitterness, it's an emotional termite. You realize that it's your happiness and your joy that you are sabotaging and that the other person has absolutely nothing to do with it. I wish that I hadn't been so compelled to sue because the anger lingered and it wore me out. When appearing on the Oprah show for the second time, Jonathan was very apologetic. I'm truly sorry about the way things ended. Now I'm a much better person. I've grown a lot through the whole experience. I try to be a better friend to my family and my friends, and if I ever have a boyfriend or a partner, I like to be a better person to them. To work through this traumatic experience, Terry wrote Getting to Happy, which is a sequel to Waiting to Exhale. It was published in 2010. I wanted to make this video because How Stella Got Her Groove Back is one of my favorite Terry McMillan films, but every time I watch it, I always remember the sad backstory, and I truly think he went into the situation knowing he could use her. I also think she had to have some sort of idea, but wanted to ignore the signs. I even remember reading that when men and women would check Jonathan out, he said that Terry loved it, which I find very interesting because a similar moment happened in the film when Stella and Winston went to the movies. Women were noticeably checking him out, but Stella wasn't feeling it. Even though I wasn't allowed to watch this film until I was grown, for obvious reasons, I thought touching on this history would be a great video. I also plan on making a video analyzing all of Terry McMillan's movies and touching on their unique themes and how they correlate to the black woman's experience during that time as well as now. But that'll be a long time from now because I have a list of videos I'm working on. But as always, I appreciate the watch and love you all. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Bye. I don't have any regrets for marrying my ex-husband. None whatsoever. I probably had seven or eight years of the best years of my life, of my adult life. 
I think it's a lot healthier to be able to focus on what was good because to me that resonates more. Are you and he still friends at this point? We're, I, I have forgiven him mm -hmm. and he's not my BFF but we're, we're, <laughs> but we're friends. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. I don't, I, you know, I mean I used to hate his guts mm -hmm. but I, I, you know, I went through something and you know after a while anger can kill you. It's like a termite. And bitterness is, it can hurt you and it can make it so that you don't allow love to come back into your life at all. And I find that sad, and not to give anybody else that much power over your life and your, your happiness. It's not worth it.